And we'll go over a specific circuit for doing that later on. Um, not today, but later on when, when we're doing more C-mode stuff. But I also mentioned last time that 14 by 14 circuit that I said was super soft dual. That's basically what it does. It, it takes a tooth table and it breaks it up into two separate cells, stores it in two pieces, neither of which is live. And that's one way that that circuit lets you have complete control over the truth table. I didn't make a slide for this, but I just noticed that somebody picked up on this in their homework. Um, If you have a cell like that, where all of your data outputs and all your control outputs are one, okay, so your whole truth table is filled with ones instead of zeros, that's a really interesting truth table pattern. That's sort of the ultimate live cell because all of its C outputs and all of its D outputs are going to be asserted. And once this cell begins asserting its C outputs, there's no way to get control of it, okay, because What it's going to do is put a 1 into the C input of each of its neighbors. Each of these cells is going to go into C mode. And a C mode cell can never assert its C output. And so none of these cells can configure this middle cell. And so this cell is stuck forever. It's always going to have this truth table of 1s, and there's no way to change that. Okay, so that's sort of, that's sort of the extreme opposite of, of a, uh, a truth table with all zeros, which is doing nothing. This cell can never be changed. Okay, you can reset the whole matrix, but you can never get control of this cell again. Okay, now that can be kind of weird, but it can actually be really useful. Um, can we think of a possible use for a cell that can't be configured? Think about faults. Simulate a fault, true, definitely do that. Anything else? Faulty cell, you can put a cell like that next to the fault and disable the faulty cell. Right, right. Um, more, more generally than that, um, if you have your matrix and you have some region in here where there's some sort of defect, okay, maybe it was manufactured, maybe some of the wires have melted from overuse, and there's just bad things going on in here, and you know, a single cell can theoretically reconfigure the whole matrix. Okay, or two cells actually. So you have some cells in here that are misbehaving. You can build what's called a guard ring. And each of these cells is one of these. And if you build this whole ring around here of cells that can never be reconfigured, nothing in here can affect anything out here. Okay, the only way that this could affect this is by reconfiguring one of these cells <coughs> to make some change over here. If these are cells that are completely unchangeable in this guard ring, then you've isolated this region of defective cells from the rest of the matrix. Wouldn't you have to alternate them so they're not configuring each other? Well, um... <coughs> So when you want to build a guard ring, for example, this cell down here, you would just build it like that. You put a one in the control. Um, you don't need to guard this side or this side or this side because those are outside the defective region. Okay, so you're not actually using this cell, you're using a modified version of it, you're using the same principle that you cannot be configured from a cell in which you're putting out C mode. And over here, you would put a one into these C inputs and so on. And as long as this inner line of cells is working properly, and as long as the guard cells are working properly, then you've got complete isolation. But you're right, you don't want to put out west and east if they're adjacent to each other.
So kind of a weird circuit, but but um, but useful in some cases, and that actually is something that that has been used in some uh, fault-resistant circuits. Is the idea of guard walls and guard rings. Okay. Um, I talked about the simulator a bit last week, but I, and I did a demo, but I didn't really put any slides up. So mainly just so that you have some of these in um, in the lecture note PDF file. I thought I'd just go through a few comments on the simulator um, again. First of all, um, I forgot to mention most of the commands are case sensitive, and they're mostly lowercase. Um, so if you're trying to set an input, it's a lowercase s, not an uppercase. Um, most of the commands that you'll actually use, um, the s command for setting an input, put in a row and column, and then put in the side DN for data north, CW for control west, and then a one or a zero. Those are all separated by spaces, and they're all lowercase. That sets an input value. Um, D row column dumps a truth table from a cell so you can look at it. Um, B row column shows you Boolean equations for a cell's truth table. Um, C row column lets you input reverse Polish notation equations. To, um, to define a self truth table, and you end with a single dot, um, followed by enter. Um, T ticks the system clock one clock tick. T followed by a number ticks it that many clock ticks. Um, R ticks it 128 ticks, it does one programming cycle. Or R followed by a number, it does that many programming cycles. Um, L, which is a lowercase l, row column file name loads a binary file. Um, we'll talk about binary files in a few more minutes. Um, usually just load it into zero, zero in the upper left corner. You can load them anywhere you want. Um, o shows you the, the outputs of a cell. So O row column, it just gives you a tabular list of the DNC outputs. Um, U is the update rate. Um, it tells you how often the display, the graphical window, how often that's updated. And the default is to update it once every tick. So every time the system clock ticks, it goes through and it updates all of the, uh, the inputs and outputs <coughs> themselves. Um, update rate of 128 is useful. It just sort of shows you what happens after each programming cycle. Um, G enters a free run mode where the system clock just runs at the maximum speed. So as soon as the circuit stabilizes, it ticks the clock again. Um, once you're in free run mode, the command line input is disabled because the GUI has control. If you go into the GUI and you hit an escape key, that brings you back to the command line and stops the clock. Um, an at sign followed by a file name with no space executes commands from the file name. Um, and you can put in any of the commands here if you want. And you can nest them. You can put other command files inside a command file. Um, uppercase I clears out the whole matrix, resets everything to the startup point, And uppercase Q takes you out of the program. Okay, let me um, let me show you some bootstrapping, just because we've talked about it a few times, haven't really gone through any details. Um, basically just lists in hex the bit pattern to be sent to each of those four inputs. So for the first 128 clock ticks, it'll use these four patterns on those four inputs, and then these four, and so on and so on. 
and there's Java classes that you use to create sequence files. Um, we don't need to worry about that yet. But I just want to sort of show you um, this particular sequence file. When you run it, it basically configures this cell initially, and then it basically uses this and this cell to configure other cells. And what it's doing is building something that's called a wire. It's a two-channel wire in this case. Uh, sorry, three-channel. Um, and the wire is basically used to build more wire and also to build this line of cells up here. And right now, all it's doing is sort of building <coughs> a set of wires to give it control over these cells down here in the bottom right. And from this point on, all we're doing is controlling three data inputs on the left. We don't need the C input anymore. But it basically comes down, it's configuring these three cells, and then it'll do something called a break. It'll break the wire to give it control of this cell again, and it'll use that and continue. And if you use the update command, let's say update every 128 ticks, a little better what's happening. And this is a bootstrap sequence. This is how you can come in from a few cells on the edge of the matrix and configure a much larger um, region of cells. And what this has done is just bootstrapped um, that crossbar circuit where each cell basically comes in from uh, one side and goes out to the other. Okay, so that's, that's one way to bootstrap. And again, you can start with a totally empty matrix, and just from three cells on the edge, you can configure whatever region you want. Um, and that's one reason why we need to worry about things like cells that are malfunctioning, because it really is very simple to, um, to control large sections of the matrix from a small point. Okay, we won't talk about bootstrapping in detail for a few weeks. Um, but as I said, there's Java classes that basically let you do things like, say, I want to build a wire, I want to turn a wire, I want to copy a cell from one end of the wire to the other, things like that. Um, and they produce um, these sequence files that you can then use um, with the sequence command. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to take a section of the matrix and not um, insert control on all of them, like your guard wall? We'll make sure that they don't get anything inserted on them. Like if you wanted to isolate a section and then test to make sure there are no faults, um, hmm. and make sure that your fault, you know, like checker didn't get messed up by the fault in the system. Is there a way to isolate how? I mean, like if you were to isolate a section to make sure that the outside, like controlling circuitry which was testing the inside, didn't get affected by it. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, maybe not. I don't know if you can assert control on all of the directly inside rows and still have to check everything. Right, right. right. Um, if you're starting off and you know that the <coughs> section of the matrix is working correctly, okay, and that's where you're building your original circuit, um, you can kind of do a look ahead. You can, you know, so you know that the next row of cells or the next section of cells are functioning correctly. That's sort of an initial assumption. Um, you temporarily configure those and use them to do the testing in the next region. Um, but you can build a guard wall and still take it down later. So you can build a guard wall that lets you get through and still have faith that if something in here starts misbehaving and comes out, it's not going to get control over what's on this side. And so you can do your testing through that guard wall. <coughs> Once you decide it's correct and all the cells are working fine, then you can kind of move up one level. So yeah, you can do what you're describing. How would you go about testing a cell to see if it's working correctly? What kinds of things could you do? Just attempt to program it once and then read back. The, well, you can start by reading back the truth table, mm -hmm. but you also might want to read it back from each side. Right. Okay, so you could load in a, a truth table, 
you can try to read it back. It lets you know if C mode is working, it lets you know if your inputs are working, it lets you know if your outputs are working. Um, you can read an empty cell and make sure it's got all zeros. They'll tell you if there's any bits stuck at one inside. You can do the same thing with ones, see if there's any stuck at zeros. You can alternate ones and zeros. That'll tell you if two cells are shorted together somehow. Um, you can load different truth tables. You can make the thing an echo and just send in a value and see if you read back the value. You can make an inverter so you know the inputs and outputs aren't shorted together. Um, so there's a whole there's a whole regimen of, of tests that you can perform on cells depending on what you want to use the cell for. And if you're only going to configure it from one side, you may not care if the other sides are working. If you don't know what you're going to be using it for, you may want to do something more exhaustive, like test it from all sides and such. Is there a pattern that's, that's available that tests like an arbitrary um, side cell or an inside cell or uh, that toggles all the flip-flops and fair toggles all the um, gates inside and make sure that they work? Uh, not directly. Kind of like a JTAG scan or something. Um, not directly, but you can get pretty close, but you need to know how the cell is implemented. Okay, for example, you need to know how the truth table memory is, is laid out if you want to test for shorts between adjacent um, memory bits. You need to know how it's organized. Um, but depending on, on what the actual implementation architecture is, you can usually do a pretty good job of, of testing um, at least the most likely failures that you'd expect. But no, there's not really one pattern that just exercises all the internal circuitry. You have to kind of ferret it out by looking at uh, inputs and outputs for different functions. Um, I think the next slide was the layout program. Um, so later today, Hopefully, I'm going to put up another piece of software, which is the layout program um, for actually creating circuits graphically and then turning them into binary files that you can read in the simulator. Um, but I just want to sort of give you a basic um, overview of the loader program. Um, again, it's written in Java. It should work under Windows and Linux. Um, if you run into problems, let me know. It's a Java archive, a jar file, but then there's also a set of files you need to um, put somewhere which contain the library of cells, and you need to set up an environment variable um, to point to that library. So I'll put all those instructions up in the software section under resources, along with the, uh, the code itself. But anyway, this is the basic um, layout program. It's basically one main window and sort of an informational window, which mostly doesn't do anything. When it starts putting out information, there's usually a problem. Um, each of these blocks is going to represent a cell, and if you have an existing grid, for example, um, cross dot grid, so this is the crossbar program. It opens up in a new window, and And it's just a graphical display of, of what your different cells might be doing. Now, you can point to a cell and you can say edit. And in this particular case, if you try to edit this, you get an error saying can't edit a composite cell. Okay, composite means you've taken two or more cells and put them together. And if you want to edit a composite cell, um, you say explode composite cell. And you'll get a new window and you see which cells made up that composite cell. So in this case, it's not surprisingly four cells, each one <coughs> being a different piece of the crossbar. Um, if you click on a cell and you say edit, you'll actually see what, what it's composed of. Um, semicolons are comments. Um, dot description and dot end um, house information that can be available in some of the simulation tools. So you can sort of ignore those. And then you have Boolean equations, um, data east equals west. And you have an icon that shows you what this what this cell does. If you click on this cell and you say edit or control E, um, it's exactly the same cell. It goes from east to west. Okay, it's stored in a library called wire.lib, and the cell name is west arrow east. Um, in fact, all four of these cells, even though these pictures look different, they're exactly the same cell. They're all the cell west east from wire.lib. 
Okay, so cells can be rotated. You can take a cell and um, you can say edit, rotate, or you can say control.